and uh, Toda Raba. I have uh, one administrative request. Uh, my wife is here, I want her in, and you have seats here in the front. Please. Okay. There are two seats here. Okay. There are two seats here. Now I feel safe and easy. I can start talking. Okay. <laughs> Welcome all. Great pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, those waiting outside, why don't you come in and stand along the wall? There is no execution today. <laughs> OK. So I will start uh, my talk right away, because our time is very limited. And at 5 o'clock, we are supposed to be out of here for another occasion. Plus minus Five o'clock Barilan style. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, this uh, and this is this is small, really. Can you see it from the back? Yes. yes. Okay, fine. Good eyesight. So the talk is the discovery of quasi periodic crystal, the role of TEM. TEM is the transmission electron microscope, and I will I will dwell on that uh, a little bit. So in order to explain you uh, what happens. Uh, in the discovery. Let me take you back to the mid-80s. In the mid-80s, many of you were not born yet, there were three surprising discoveries on the structure of matter and its properties. And these three discoveries came year after year, starting in 1984, and all three of them received the Nobel Prize. So it's a rare occasion. So let's start with the first one. The first one, chronologically, is the discovery of uh, quasi-periodic uh, crystals. And the names are Schechtman, Blech, Denis, Gratias, and John Kahn. I'll tell you about these people later on. A year later, 1985, came the discovery of fullerens. A year later came the discovery of high-temperature superconductivity. Now, when high-temperature superconductivity was discovered, everybody was happy. Of course, superconductivity was known to exist since 1909. But nobody expected, really, high temperature superconductivity to exist. High temperature means liquid nitrogen temperatures instead of liquid helium temperatures. That's the high temperature. So when it was discovered, everybody was happy. There was no resistance. <coughs> nobody was objecting the discovery. The year before, when fullerenes were discovered, fullerenes are just another way in which a singular or graphite can fold to form a ball. These are fullerens, named after Buckminster Fuller, a famous architect. They're also called buckyballs, again after Buckminster Fuller, the architect. And um, when fullerens were discovered, and they really started the field of nanomaterials, when they were discovered, there was no objection to the discovery. Everybody was happy. But when quasi-periodic crystals were discovered, and I think that if we could have the front lights off, it will help the contrast. <coughs> when um, quasi-periodic crystals were discovered, yeah, and even those, they met with a lot of opposition. In fact, most of the scientific community opposed the very notion of quasi-periodicity in crystals. And in my uh, talk, you will understand why this was uh, the case. But before we even start, you should know a few things. And I know that uh, quite a few of you are not uh, in the fields of crystallography or, or even science. So let me explain a few basic things. And I would like to dwell on order in crystals, on periodicity, and on rotational symmetry. Let's start with order. What you see here is a drawing, a two-dimensional drawing of a lattice. These are supposedly atoms. <coughs> and clearly, you see that there is order here. It means that if I ask you to continue this in this direction or in this direction, any other direction, you will know how to do that. You understand the order, and that's, that's that. That's all about order. What about periodicity? This structure, this two-dimensional structure, is also periodic. It means the following. If you look at this direction, the red line here, this is a direction in the lattice. You see that the distances between every two atoms is the same. So there is periodicity from here to here to here to here. 
And because the structure is periodic, there is periodicity in each and every direction. Like this direction, there is periodicity. And in this direction, there is periodicity. That's all about periodicity. Now let's say a few words about rotational symmetry. This lattice is the same as I have drawn before, except that I have added a little handle here, this red handle, so that you see what happens when I rotate it. And I can rotate it 90 degrees, and it looks the same. And 180 degrees, and it looks the same. 270 degrees, and 360. And every time it looks the same. This means that this lattice has a four-fold rotation symmetry. You can do it four times, one, two, three, four, and every time it looks the same. It has a four-fold rotation symmetry. Let me give you a few examples of other rotation symmetry. But let's first define rotation symmetry. An image has a rotational symmetry if there is a center point around which the object is turned a certain number of degrees, and the object still looks the same. That is, it matches itself a number of times while it is being rotated. And here are a few examples. This card has a two-fold rotation symmetry. You can rotate it 180 degrees, and it will look the same. And again, 360, and it will look the same. You can do it one, two. That is um, two-fold rotation symmetry. This set of triangles has a three-fold rotation symmetry. You can turn it 120 degrees, 120, 120, and every time it will look the same. This uh, flower here has a five-fold rotation symmetry. And this pizza has a six-fold rotation symmetry. You can rotate it one-sixth of a turn, and it will look just the same. So this is about rotation symmetry. So now we know about order, periodicity, and rotation symmetry. And all of them are important to understand quasi-periodic materials. <coughs> Let's say a few words about crystallography. Crystallography, modern crystallography, I should say, started in 1912 by a seminal uh, work by von Laue, a German scientist who performed a wonderful experiment and he proved in one experiment two very important facts. Number one, he, he performed an X-ray diffraction experiment. That means he took a beam of X-rays that has one wavelength, beam of X-rays, and directed it onto a crystal. And his crystal was, I think, zinc selenide. And the beam diffracted and created a diffraction pattern on a plate, on a photographic film. And by this experiment, he proved, number one, that indeed atoms in crystals are ordered as people thought before, and therefore they can diffract. He also showed that X-rays had a wavy nature, and they are electromagnetic waves. One experiment, two wonderful results. The fact that von Laue performed his, X, his uh, diffraction experiment by X-rays, it was an X-ray diffraction, was very important to the field of crystallography. First of all, it gave a tool, an objective tool for the first time to study crystals with high precision. Now, if you look back into the field of crystallography, you may realize that thousands of years ago, people had the right notion about crystals. And the Greeks had the notion of an atom that cannot be split and they looked at crystals that grew in nature, and they saw that they have certain shapes. They had facets and certain angles between the facets, and concluded that if materials are made indeed of atoms, then the atoms are arranged in certain ways. And in 1850, a, scientist, a British scientist named Bravais, mathematician, predicted without any experimental data that there are only 14 lattices in which crystals can form. These are called the 14 Bravais lattices. Mr. Bravais did also something which is not known to many people, and it's quite fascinating. He predicted that if indeed there's order in atoms and so on, 
then the distance between two atoms will be of the order of one-tenth of a nanometer, one angstrom. And it's correct. How did you know that? I'll never know. Maybe I will. This was wonderful. But let me tell you something in general. If you look back into different fields of science, you find a thread of wisdom going back to the Greeks or to the Romans or to the Jews or whatever. But most of the sort of scientific information that was passed from generation to generation was sheer nonsense. It was not true. People had crazy idea about how the world is built, what is it, what it is made of, and so on. So, yes, looking back, you find a thread of wisdom. But if from the, from during these these days, people spoke mostly nonsense about science. They did not understand our world. We partially understand it now, partially. So this is crystallography. Now. Based on the results of von Lauer and his followers, and, and all the crystals that von Lauer studies and all the crystals that were studied after von Lauer, we had two things in common. Number one, they were ordered, and therefore crystals, and they were also periodic. All of them were periodic. Hundreds of thousands of crystals were periodic. And so based on this, huge number of observation, a definition of a crystal was formed. And here are two examples. This is from a book by Kaliti, X-ray diffraction by Kaliti. And a crystal may be defined as a solid composed of atoms arranged in a pattern periodic in three dimensions. A crystal is ordered and periodic. That's it. That was a crystal. Very simple, straightforward. No, no, nobody can argue about it based on hundreds of thousands of observations. Another definition, this is a, a book from uh, Bart and Masalski. Same definition, different words. Atoms in a crystal are arranged in a pattern that repeats itself in three dimensions throughout the interior of the crystal. Same definition, different words. A crystal is order and periodic. Now, the body that governs the field of crystallography the body, the scientific body, that decided what's right and what's wrong in crystallography is, was named and still is named the, um, so, uh, the uh, <laughs> what's the name? These, these are mathematical crystallographers, non-nonsense mathematical crystallographers that, uh, that form the body that defines everything about crystallography. And these are hardcore mathematical crystallographer, no nonsense crystallographers. And I, I know at least one mathematician in this crowd, and, 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 and I know that these are very serious people. It's called the International Union of Crystallography. This body determined everything, what's right and what's wrong. And this body declared that the field of crystallography is a mature field. Mature means that everything is understood we understand everything about this field. We will develop more precise ways to measure crystals and to determine their properties, crystallographic properties. We may find many more crystals. And for every type of crystal, we have a drawer. If we find a new one, welcome, new one. And we put it in the drawer. Everything was thought to be understood and known about crystallography. OK, so these were the definition. Now, crystallography in 1982, and I mentioned 1982 because this was the year that I made a discovery, can be exemplified by this uh, book by Charles Kittel. I know you cannot read this thing that Mark in green. I enlarged it for you, and now maybe you can. And he says the following. We can make a crystal from molecules which individually have a five-fold rotation axis. That means every molecule. but we should not expect the lattice to have a five-fold rotation axis. Lattices cannot have five-fold rotation axis. Why so? I will explain you shortly. But before doing that, let us look at atoms. How do they look like? Well, here is a picture that I took many years ago of uh, carbon <coughs> atoms in diamond. And uh, you see clearly that first of all there is order. These are each white spot is a carbon atom. There is order. 
And uh, for instance, look at this direction, you see that there is periodicity. In this direction, periodicity. In this direction, periodicity. Any direction that you choose in a periodic lattice has periodicity. So this is a periodic lattice. And the order of carbon atoms in diamond is periodic. And the allowed rotation symmetries are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. Five-fold rotation symmetry, as well as any other symmetry, beyond 6 is forbidden in periodic structures. I'll say it again. In periodic structures, you can have a two-fold rotation symmetry, three, four, six rotation symmetry, no five, and nothing beyond six. This was true. It is true in periodic crystals. OK. Now, when we perform a diffraction experiment, and you can deform a ex diffraction experiment from any type of electromagnetic waves, you can have optical diffraction, you can have X-ray diffraction, electron diffraction, neutron diffraction. You can diffract in many ways. I was using electron diffraction. The tool of choice of the International Union of Crystallography was X-ray diffraction. And this made a difference. Here is a diffraction pattern taken in electron microscope. What do you do in an electron microscope? In the electron microscope, you have a, an electron beam that comes, it's an accelerated beam. What's the acceleration voltage? About 200,000 volts. Comes down onto a specimen. Let's say this is a specimen. We make the specimen very thin, so much so that the beam can go through the specimen and hit a phosphor screen at the bottom of the electron microscope. Have you ever seen a phosphor screen? Anybody? <laughs> Television? Cell phone? Yeah. OK. So this is what happens. The transmitted beam is this beam here, right there, the fat one in the center, is the transmitted beam. This is the beam that goes through and hit the center. All the other beams are diffracted beam. OK. So this is a diffraction pattern. And also, there is periodicity in this diffraction pattern. You can clearly see that there is periodicity. The rotation symmetries that are allowed are, again, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, no 5, and nothing beyond 6. The, uh, the rules in the real space, where the atoms exist, also apply in the reciprocal space, which is a mathematical space. We'll not go into it now, in which the diffraction pattern forms. Now, here is periodicity in this direction and periodicity in this direction, and periodicity in this direction, any direction, periodicity in the real space and in the reciprocal space, which is the diffraction pattern. Life was simple. Everything was clear. Everything was periodic. Wonderful. And then something shocking happened. That group of eminent, no-nonsense mathematical crystallographers <laughs> that formed the International Union of Crystallography change the definition of a crystal. And the definition of a crystal is the foundation on which the whole science lies. What is a crystal? And this body of strict mathematicians came up with a definition which is a poem. Yep, let's read it. You will see. It says the following. By crystal we mean any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. Let us stop here. It doesn't say crystal is. It says by crystal we mean soft. Any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. And by a periodic crystal we mean any crystal in which three dimensional lattice periodicity can be considered to be absent. Is this a poem or what? This is the softest definition that exists in, in, in science, I think. It is so soft, it means we don't know anything anymore. <laughs> and this is from this body, which is stricter than the Catholic Synod. I mean, these are tough people. And did they come up with a poem like this? This is the new definition of a crystal. OK. And this came about in 1992. But I'll tell you what happened between 1982 and 92 shortly. 
Okay, 1982 was the 70th birthday of crystallography, and this was the year in which quasi-periodic crystals were discovered. To see what happened in the day of the discovery, in the hour of the discovery, let me take you to my laboratory. It was at NBS, National Bureau of Standards, as mentioned before, in the United States, in Maryland. I was doing my first sabbatical there for two years, from 1981 to 1983, with my family. And uh, this is where I made a discovery. A few months after my arrival, I made a discovery. And to understand what happens, let me take you back to my laboratory and show you my logbook from that day, okay? And you, many of you will be researchers, and uh, rule number one is to write things in a notebook so that you will know what you did back in 1982 <laughs> when you get 40 years later or 30 years later. So here is the page in my uh, logbook. Now, this was not intended to be seen by anybody. It was, it's written for me, so it's written in a sloppy way. And uh, it's written in shorthand, but let me explain what you see here. The date here, I, I doubt that you can see it because the screen is very small. The date is April 8, 1982, and I was working on aluminum 25% manganese. This is an alloy of aluminum and 25% manganese that I have prepared in the laboratory. I prepared this alloy, and it was rapidly solidified, certain way in which you cast material. The numbers here is the plate numbers. This is plate 1720, so there are many before and many after. SAD doesn't mean that I was said this morning. It only means that this is selected area diffraction. This is a diffraction pattern. So I took a diffraction pattern, and then I can go back and take plate 1720 and see the diffraction pattern and so on and so forth. Plate number 1724 is a picture, not a diffraction pattern. Magnification 36,000 times. I look at this picture and say, hmm, that's very odd. What's going on here? I will show you that picture soon, and I'll tell you what's, what was odd in it. Then I said, OK, let me take a diffraction pattern of that. So I take a diffraction pattern, plate number 1725. Selected the right diffraction pattern. Tenfold with three question marks? That cannot be. Tenfold rotation symmetry. They only allow that one, two, three, four, and six. No five and nothing beyond six. What's going on? I'll show you that and explain you why it was difficult to understand. And then I said, okay, I think I know what the problem is. What I have here is a material with defects, and the defects are called twins. Now, I'll show you what twins are shortly. And this is what I thought. And I said to myself, let me record this twin. Let me take a picture of these twins and forget about it because it's not interesting. But I couldn't find them. They were not there. The diffraction pattern was an inherent property of the crystal. There were no defects. OK, let's continue. So here is it. This is the defining moment. April 8th, nice day outside. What am I doing in the dark of the electron microscope? 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm. OK. So this was the picture 1724. This was the first view of what was later called the icosahedral phase. I'll tell you why it was called that way. So what, what do we see here? We see here crystals. This is one crystal. Here is another crystal. Here is another. They're small. This is half a micron. So the crystals are of the order of one micron or even less than that. But some of these crystals were pitch black. See this one? And this, and this, and this, and this. They're pitch black. Now, when a crystal is pitch black, it means that the transmitted beam has almost no intensity. This is bright field image, for those of you who understand what I'm talking about. But most of the energy, if not all, goes to the diffracted beams. And I have never seen such a black crystal in my life before, and I was a veteran electron microscopist by that time. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. And then I took a diffraction pattern from this crystal only. Just this, just this one here. And voila, this is what I see. Now I look at the diffraction pattern, and there are several things that happen. Number one, I said, what is the rotational symmetry? So I started to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> no, no, cannot be. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I write tenfold with three question mark. But that's not all. You see, there is no periodicity here. This structure 
is has a uh, tenfold rotation symmetry. Later on, it, it, uh, it was found to be fivefold, but I could not tell by this image. I needed to, to do another experiment called Kikuchi pattern to know that this is really fivefold, but that doesn't matter. But look here. Look at the ratios of distances. There is no periodicity here. Take the distance from the center to this <coughs> spot here, multiply it by two, and you get here. And there is nothing there. Take the distance, this distance from here to here, multiply by two, and you get here, and there is nothing there, and so on and so forth. The ratios of distances, this distance from here to here, divided by the distance from here to here, is an irrational number tau, known also as the Fibonacci number, which is 1 plus root 5 divided by 2, which is 1.618. What I just said, because there is at least one mathematician here, I want to be very precise. I shouldn't have said that. Because if I take this distance and divide by this distance, from here to here, divide by this from here to here, I should get a racial number. And I, this tau is an irrational number. You cannot get it by measurements. This comes from theory later on. So I look at the diffraction pattern. By the way, this, this uh, number is called the Fibonacci number, or the golden mean, and it's an irrational number, 1.618, an endless <coughs> number of digits behind it. So irration numbers came into crystallography. Five-fold rotation symmetry. What's going on? OK. Now, that diffraction pattern was not the only one, because you see, you can take your specimen, and you can tilt it to different orientation. You can rotate it to different orientation. And every time, you can take a diffraction pattern that defines all the diffraction patterns of that crystal. So these are, these are the important um, diffraction patterns. We have five fold here, five, two fold here, and five again, and five, three, two, three. These are in the different orientation, and the angles are marked here. 37 degrees from here, 58 degrees from here, 79 degrees from here. This is the, this is the one here, say it's this, and then so, and so, and so, different angles. OK. This defines an icosahedral order. What is an icosahedral order? I will explain. But now let me make a brief, um, a brief uh, slowing down of the of the uh, uh, of the lecture and and point out to you uh, the following. When I was a master's student at the Technion, I took a class in crystallography, and uh, one of the questions in the final exam was prove that five-fold rotation symmetry cannot exist in crystals. <laughs> and I proved it. And I passed the exam. And this is why I am here now. So let me show you one way which, in which you can prove that five-fold rotation crystals cannot exist. Five-fold rotation symmetry cannot exist in crystals, in periodic crystals, because all crystals were periodic. So this is still true. In periodic crystals, you cannot have five-fold rotation symmetry. So the proof, one of the ways to prove it is this way. Let's take two atoms, P, atom P and atom Q, in a periodic lattice and make the distance between them R so that this is the shortest distance between two atoms in that lattice. These are the two closest atoms that I can find in that lattice. Very well. Now, if five-fold rotation symmetry is allowed, then I should be able to rotate Q around P five times, and P around Q five times, and let's see what happens. So here is Q, see, right here, one, two, three, four, five, and we should have a Q prime atom here, if five-fold rotation symmetry is allowed. And P, one, two, three, four, and five, and we should have a P prime atom here. But P prime Q prime is clearly the distance between them is clearly shorter than the distance PQ. So because of geometrical reasons, this cannot be. You cannot have five-fold rotation symmetry in a crystal. If you try the same experiment and prove that four-fold rotation symmetry is not allowed, it is allowed. You'll have it okay. Three-fold, it works. Two-fold, it works. Six-fold, it works. Five, no. No five-fold rotation symmetry. As I said, I passed the exam. Now. Let me explain to you what I thought I had in my, ma in, in my hands 
and these are twins. These are crystals with defects in them, or rather crystals with interesting boundary between them. And here is an example. These are, again, carbon atoms in diamond, and you have five crystals here. This is crystal number one, right here, two, three, four, and five. And uh, these crystals have different orientations, but the boundary between them, the border between them, what we call a grain boundary or, or a, a boundary between two crystals is a very special boundary. It's a mirror boundary. Look here. Look at this line of atoms here. Now, in the, here in, this, in the next crystal, here it is. So the, the, red, the, the red border, marked in red, really is a mirror. This is reflected here. Consequently, here, this reflected here. And this is reflected here, and this is reflected here, and so on and so forth. So forget about the sigma notation. They're not important now. Here is a drawing of the same thing. These are called twin boundaries. So why is it relevant to what I'm talking about? Here is why. You see, if you take a diffraction pattern from one crystal, let's say from this upper one right here, then you will get a, an ordered and periodic diffraction pattern. Nothing special. But if you take a diffraction pattern of all of them together, then you will have five superimposed diffraction patterns. One from here, one from here, one from here, one from here, one from here. So you'll have one diffraction pattern. 72 degrees, another one. 72 degrees, another one. Another one. Five of them. And when you have five of them, then you will create a combination, a combined diffraction pattern, which have five fold rotation symmetry. But it doesn't come from one crystal. It comes from five crystals. OK. Here is another example. This crystal here is from the aluminum uh, iron uh, system, aluminum iron system. They are very abundant. You can find them there. And you can see them in an optical microscope. They are quite large. You see, it looks like a flower. Each one of these is a crystal. One, two, three, four, five. There are 10 of them. And they are twin related. Again, we have twin boundaries between them. In reality, there are only five crystals here because the orientation of this one here is exactly the orientation of this one here. And the orientation of this one here is exactly like that. So there are five of them. Again, if you take a diffraction pattern for one, you'll have a periodic diffraction pattern. But if you take a diffraction pattern from all of them, you'll have a superimposed diffraction pattern. And here's an example. So this is an example. This was taken from that crystal, but from all of them together. So it looks like five or 10 fold rotation symmetry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But this one is a pseudo diffraction pattern because it's combined of five separate diffraction patterns, which are 72 degrees from each other. This is what I thought I have, because I had this experience before. And this is why I performed a series of experiments. Here is one, by the way. This is one diffraction pattern. And you have five of them. And this is periodic, as you can see. Periodic in each and every direction, right? Periodicity here, periodicity here, and so on. OK, so I performed a series of experiments. I will skip the details of this experiment for the sake of time. And one is called dark field experiment. I was looking for twins, no twins. Couldn't find twins. I did micro diffraction experiment, looking for twins, no twins. All this was done on day one. Everything here is on that page from day one. And uh, the last experiment was made from, by friends of mine in France and in, uh, in France, actually. I will not repeat this experiment, but it shows again that there are no twins. These are atoms in the icosahedral phase. OK, and these are a modern picture. 1984, I came back to a Technion. Actually, I came back 1983 in the summer. And uh, there I found the first person who was willing to work with me, join force, and see what's going on. And he contributed a model that could explain how these crystals could have formed. His name is Ilan Blech. He was a professor at Technion. Shortly after we published the paper, he left to go to someplace else. 
But th so this was the paper, uh, the Schertmann Blech, which you cannot see here. And uh, what happened was the following. We wrote this paper. That summer I came back to, uh, to NBS. And uh, you know, those days we could not type. We had secretaries that typed for us. The old generation knows that. The young generation can't even imagine that you have to give somebody else to type your papers. But that's the way it was. So the secretary typed that paper. We put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it. Remember envelope stamps? <laughs> mail, snail mail, yeah. And I sent it to journal named Journal of Applied Physics. A couple of weeks later, or a month later, the paper came back in another envelope, another stamp, and it came with a letter saying that uh, we are sorry, we're not going to publish your paper because it will not interest the community of physicists. Why don't you send it to a metallurgical journal? So I sent it to a metallurgical journal, named Metallurgical Transactions. It was accepted and published, but it was published more than half a year into the future, in the middle of 1985. In the meantime, I showed that paper to my host, his name is John Kahn, at NBS, that summer of 1984, and asked him, why do you think the paper was rejected so swiftly? So he read uh, the paper, we had some arguments and discussions, and he proposed to send another paper, much shorter, a more concise version of the first one without the Elon Black model, just my findings from day one, and we sent and we added one more name of Denis Gratias, a mathematical crystallographer from France, who came to reaffirm my findings that everything is okay. And uh, we sent another paper for publication. That was sent and published almost right away. And in November of 12, of 1984, this paper arrived. This is the second paper that was written by far more concise, but it was the first to appear. And it appeared in PRL, Physical Review Letters. And then hell broke loose. Immediately I started to get telephone calls from around the world. Hey, Danny, we have it, we have it, this is fantastic. I explained how I prepared my materials. My colleagues from around the world, and there was a community created very quickly around the world. And uh, people from France and Germany and China and Japan and, and Israel and the United States and everywhere, people started to work on this new material. We had a growing community of avant-garde young scientists who took my discovery and made it into a science that grew very, very rapidly. Okay. Why icosahedral symmetry? This is an icosahedron. And uh, this is a platonic solid. And uh, many of the quasi periodic crystals, but many, but not all, of the quasi periodic crystals have icosahedral symmetry. And uh, this uh, icosahedron have six five fold axes, 10 three fold, and 15 two fold. Here is an example of one five fold axis. Look here. If you look from here to the center, put your eye here. Not to close it sharp. Put, look to the center, then you see a five fold rotation symmetry. From here, again, five fold. From here, again, we have six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Down here is the negative of that, so we don't count it. So these are five fold rotation axes, and then we have six of them, and so on and so forth. And because my first crystals had exactly the same. Symmetry, we call the first phase the icosahedral phase, or later on known as the I phase, icosahedral phase. Now, many people know icosahedron because they look at a football, and in a football, you have, football has icosahedral symmetries. And uh, you can clearly see the five fold rotation symmetry here, the two fold here, the three fold here, and I doubt that uh, football players know that they play with icosahedral symmetry, but nevertheless, they entertain. Now, the man you have to know about regarding quasi-periodicity is Mr. Leonardo Fibonacci de Pisa. His friends called him Blockhead, but he was the greatest mathematician of his time, and maybe 500 years later, he was great. 
In the year 1202, in the beginning of the 13th century, he published a paper. And in his paper, he did the following. By the way, this is his drawing, a drawing of him. This is a, a real picture of a statue on his grave. And his grave is just behind the inclined tower of Pisa. Just behind the inclined tower, there is a cemetery under a roof. And, uh, and it's very small. And, so, and it's there. So if you ever go to see the inclined tower of Pisa, spend a couple of minutes in the graveyard, say hello for me to Mr. Fibonacci, the Pisa. Now, what, what did he do so great and so relevant to our findings? You have to know about the Fibonacci rabbits. Now, the Fibonacci rabbits, this is general knowledge. You don't have to know chemistry or physics or mathematics, but you should know about Mr. Fibonacci rabbits because this is general knowledge. So what about them? Here is the Gedanken experiment that he did, a thoughtful experiment he did. He said, let's say that we have a female rabbit, right? and she has a husband or a boyfriend and who visits her, and now she's pregnant. Okay, so in the next month, she gives birth to a little one. Another visit, and next month, she gives birth to another little one. But this little one matures before it can reproduce. That's all, these are the two rules. In the first month, this mother gives birth to a little one. This little one matures, and this grown up gives birth to a little one. And that's it. And now that you understand the rules, you can continue this list forever because there is order. There is a rule how to do it. Okay. There is order. But this order is not periodic. Look here. Look at the, at the rabbits here. Large, small. Large, large, small. Large, small. Large, large, small. Large, large, small. Large, small. And so on and so forth. There is no motif of any size. There is no series, no group of any size that repeats itself periodically. This is quasi-periodicity in one dimension. It is quasi-periodic. There is order. If I ask you how does the number 200 months look like, you will know how to do that. You can tell me, you can give me the answer because you understand the, the order. But there is no periodicity. It's quasi-periodic, quasi-periodicity in one dimension. Uh, other things that you need to know, yes, what is the question? Why is it quasi and not just aperiodic? Why, why do you call it quasi periodic? And not just aperiodic. And not aperiodic? Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Aperiodic is a broader term. Quasi periodicity is one part of, of, in, of a larger group. And we don't have crystals in the larger group yet, but we may find them. Okay? Okay. We need to know two more things. Number one, on the left you see the number of rabbits in each month. In the first one we have one, in the third month we have three, in the first one we have five, then eight, thirteen. One plus two is three. Eight plus thirteen is twenty-one. Thirteen plus thirty-one we will have thirty-four. Thirty-four plus twenty-one will have fifty-five. Okay, so the number of rabbits in each month equals the number of rabbits, the sum of the number of rabbits in the two previous months. This is what is written here. What's written here is the following in the next equation. If you go to infinity, when n goes to infinity, n is the number of months, goes to infinity, then the ratio of the last month divided by the one before is the ratio of numbers of rabbits in the last month divided by the number of rabbits in the month before is 1 plus root 5 divided by 2. This is Mr. Fibonacci's number, 1 plus 6, 1, 8, and so on. It's called tau, or the Fibonacci number. OK. And he published it in the year 1202. So and this is quasi periodicity in one dimension. Here's an example. Now, what about two dimensions? Quasi periodicity in two dimensions, Penrose styles. And here are Penrose styles. Roger Penrose, a scientist living in our time, a great mathematician, physicist, chemist, thinker, philosopher, great man living in England. And uh, he found these two tiles that can, if you, if you tile them correctly according to matching rules, then you form quasi periodicity 
in two dimensions. And these are the two uh, tiles, uh, thin rhombus and thick rhombus, okay? Thin and thick, thin and thick. The only thin and thick rhombi, 36 degrees and 72 degrees rhombi. That's it. But you have to know how to do it. There's a matching rule, it's not complicated. Once you do it, you have Penrose tiles which are quasi-periodicity in two dimension. Fibonacci, quasi-periodicity one dimension, Penrose two dimension, and quasi-crystals, quasi-periodicity in three dimensions. Which in this particular example taken by one of my students in the laboratory is quasi-periodic material based on the mag magnesium, zinc, cerium. There is magnesium, zinc, and cerium inside here. You can clearly see the fivefold facets. Beautiful. Now, mm -hmm, you're going to love this one. Now you'll have to employ your minds. Put them in gear, turn them on, and let me show you something very beautiful. Let's, what I'm going to show you is the following. I'm going to say a sentence which will sound complicated, but then it will look very simple. We can take a periodic lattice in any dimension, make a cut, and project and get from this operation of cut and projection, we'll get quasi periodic lattice in a lower dimension. We can take a periodic lattice in higher dimension, make a cut and project, and obtain a lower dimensional quasi periodic array. And here is how I do it. So the higher dimension for the demonstration will be a, a, a twofold uh, structure. A, a, a plane, a planar structure which is periodic, and uh, you can clearly see that there is periodicity here. Assume that in every intersection there is a mathematical point. That means a point with no dimension. Mathematical point in each intersection. What you can do now, you can make a cut. What is the cut? Create this strip. You can create a strip, but you can create a strip in any direction. I have chosen a very special direction, such a direction in which the tangent of alpha is the Fibonacci number tau, okay? Tangent of alpha. Tangent, for the ones of you who are not forgot high school, then this divided by this is the tangent of this angle, okay? This divided by this is the tangent. What does it mean that I've chosen an irrational number to be the tangent? It means that if I start at the lattice point here, this line will never ever meet any other point. Okay? Because if it met any other point, then the tangent would be a rational number. Here is an example. Let's say that, you know, the line passes near this point. Let us say it, it, it touches exactly on this point. Then the tangent will be this divided by this. It's a rational number. But I chose an irrational number. This line will never ever meet any other point. Now you can choose all the points inside this strip and project them onto the line. The line is a lower dimension. Okay? It's a one dimension, and this is two dimension. Periodicity in two dimension, and let's see what happens on this line. Let's look at the distances, <coughs> large, small. Large, uh, sorry, large, large, small. Large, large, small. Large, small, large, large, small. We have created Fibonacci series by cut and project. We took a periodic lattice in higher dimension, two dimensions, we made a cut and projection, and we created a quasi-periodicity on a low dimensional space, one dimensional space. Now, so this is very nice. Of course, if you have some time this evening, then you can take a six dimensional space, make a cut and project onto a three dimensional space, and then you will obtain a three dimensional quasi-periodic lattice that may exist in reality as a quasi-periodic crystal, only if you have time this evening. But now, let me show you something else. Now, I do the same thing. Here are the lines, and the tangent of alpha is exactly the Fibonacci number, and here it is. But now I bring red lines. The red lines are almost like the black lines, but not quite. They're very near, but not quite, because I made this red line touch this point here. And so the tangent of the red alpha is 11 divided by 7. You can count it. It is 11 divided by 7. This is a periodic structure. What is the periodicity? 
here is the periodicity from here to here and then there will be one more here and one more there and so on it's a large lattice but there is periodicity because the red lines are almost like the black lines these crystals that are based on the red lines which are periodic with large unit cell we call them approximants because they are approximately quasi-periodic there are now periodic crystals who are very proud to be near the quasi-periodic crystals. What a development. They're called, they called approximants, and they have special properties. OK, now the story. And the story starts in 1982, when they made a discovery. In 1984, this is between the discovery and the paper that was first published. Um, the atmosphere around me was varied between support to total rejection. Example of support, my host, John Kahn, came to my uh, office uh, and we talked about it a lot. And he said to me, the one phrase that he said, I remember is, Danny, this material is telling us something and I challenge you to explain what it is. This was encouragement. My group leader, a different person, came to my office one day, smiling sheepishly, putting a book on my desk, saying, Danny, please read this book, and you will know that what you're talking cannot be. And I said to him, you know, I don't need to read this book. It was a book of X-ray diffraction. I don't need to read this book. I teach it at Technion. I know this book. I'm telling you, my material is not in the book. Took the book, came back a couple of days later, and he said to me, Danny, you are a disgrace to my group. I cannot have you with us anymore. Please leave my group. And I left. Um, it sounds traumatic, but it was not really traumatic. Uh, I, I didn't have to leave my office or my laboratory, but I had, instead of reporting to his secretary, I reported to another secretary. It was an administrative thing rather than anything factual, but the fact is, that this was a total rejection. And everything, the atmosphere was sort of heavy. If you want to know how I felt during that period of time, it was something like that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, that cat became a tiger later on, but that's a different story. 1984, after the publication, you would think that, OK, now there are so many scientists working on a subject. Who will object? Well, the body that was objected was the International Union of Crystallography. What is the reason? Remember, it was based on X-ray diffraction. And the science was called X-ray crystallography. This was the name of the science. They did not trust electron microscopy. They did not trust electron diffraction. Why? Because electron diffraction was not precise as X-ray diffraction is. But with x-rays, you could not have discovered quasi-periodic materials because they were very small. And in order to obtain, at least those days, 30 years ago, in order to obtain x-ray diffraction from a single quasi-periodic crystal, you need a single quasi-periodic crystal to be of some size, something that you can feel between your fingers, like a grain of sand from the beach. A portion of a millimeter. We did not have that. It took us three years to grow such crystal. And then we had X ray diffraction. And in 1987, I have shown. Opa, what happened? Oh, I'm sorry, that, that just jumped into the wrong place, the red one. In 19. Um, in 1987, friends of mine from France and from uh, Japan sent me these pictures, beautiful X-ray diffraction. These are called Laue pattern, X-ray diffraction, five-fold. You can count them, five, three-fold, two-fold, beautiful pictures. I showed it in the International Union of Crystallography meeting in Perth, Australia. And then the audience said, OK, then, now you're talking. They formed a committee that later on redefined crystal. And that redefinition of a crystal was a paradigm shift in crystallography. This was the changing of the basic 
definition of what is a crystal was a paradigm shift in crystallography. Okay, so now we have the official stamp, the International Union of Crystallography approves. Who is going to object? Well, then there was Linus Pauling. <laughs> Professor Linus Pauling was arguably the, the best or the most famous and the most achieving chemist of the 20th century. He wrote the books, he, he was the great teacher, and he was also the godfather of the American Chemical Society. And he was standing on stages. He objected to the privacy. He said, he said and he wrote, and some of his papers were even published. Most were rejected, by the way, in his last days. He couldn't publish anymore because he was objecting something that was clear to everybody. But he said that no quasi-crystals are only quasi-scientists. He said, Danny Schachtman is talking nonsense on stages. And he was not alone, because being the godfather of American Chemical Society, he had the American Chemical Society behind him, hundreds of thousands of chemists. So he was not alone. And the, the, res the resistance uh, continued for quite a few years. I met Linus Pauling. I'm not going to details. We corresponded a lot. He never became a believer. And then he, he died in uh, 1984. This is 10 years after discovery. And he dedicated the last 10 years to showing that quasi-crystals, the quasi-periodic crystals are really twinned periodic crystals, which I knew from day one they were not. He spent 10 years to prove me wrong. He lost. I'm sorry that he never became a believer. OK, that's Linus Pauling. Seminal contribution, contribution towards my, of my talk. Finish in five minutes. Um, seminal, I mentioned Roger Penrose. Ellen Mackay is a um, British mathematician who, very famous one and good one, he took Roger Penrose tiles and showed that they diffract, sharp diffraction spots. You can do it by Fourier transform on the computer. Nowadays, you can do it by simulations, or you can do simply optical diffraction using a laser beam. That's Ellen Mackay. Number two. Ilan Blair, the Nigartes, and John Kahn are the people that worked with me to publish the first two papers. Ilan Blair was on both, the Nigartes and John Kahn on the second one. And, and uh, Dov Levine and Paul Steinhardt. Dov Levine is now a professor at Technion, Paul Steinhardt a professor in uh, Princeton. They took Penrose styles and showed uh, that uh, the mathematical model that explained quasi periodicity is based on three dimensional. Penrose so Elon Blech model was a physical one, I could say he joining in space, they came with a mathematical one, both are correct. This is a physical one, a mathematical one. Here's a funny story. To let you feel what we felt during that time. The year is 1986, down here. A friend of mine came to the dining room at NBS with this piece of paper in his hand and I confiscated it from him, and this is why we can see it here. So what, does he do? what do we see here? This is the month, January, February, March, April, and so on, July. I was there in July. What you have here is 1 over n. So what is n? n is number of pages in the bibliography. <laughs> we had a secretary that collected all the papers ever published on quasi-periodic materials, and we had a library, and she was the librarian, and she typed on pages the, the names of the papers. So this is the, the bibliography list of, the, of all the papers. And so this is n. And what you have here is 1 over n. So if, if 1 over n is 0 0.1, it means that n is 10, right? Uh, 10 pages. 10 pages means about 200 papers, maybe 20 papers on each page of the bibliography. Okay, so my friend took uh, this, uh, her results and uh, made access here. So in, in uh, March we had this, and in May we had this, and in July when I came there we had this number of pages. And as a good scientist, he connected them all with a straight line. <laughs> and then we realized that in December of 1986, the number of papers on quasi-periodic materials will reach infinity. 
Well, that didn't happen. But this was the feeling that the world is really exploding with activity. It was a fantastic, fantastic feeling. Phil, fantastic. And and every you know, you know we felt like like this wow like that that and we had friends suddenly from all over the world and we had conferences and we had it was a fantastic period. Okay, a while as before, order was synonym to periodicity. Now we had order that is either periodic or quasi-periodic, and it's open-ended. We may find more crystals with other type of order in the International Union of Crystallography. By its definition of a crystal, left it open. They became humble, and the humble scientist is a good scientist. Now, time for questions, and I will ask the first question, and I will also answer it. <laughs> Why is it that quasi-periodic materials were never discovered before 1982? Is it because they're very rare, and I stumbled upon them? Is it because they're not stable? You touch them, and they transform? Is it because they're difficult to make, and only me, with my magic hands, made one? Or is it because they're made of rare, esoteric elements? What is it? Why they were not discovered before? 70 years of crystallography, hundreds of thousands of studies on hundreds of thousands of crystals by a huge number of excellent scientists, and nobody saw quasi-periodic materials? What's going on? Because they're rare? No. Quasi-periodic materials are not at all. There are hundreds of them. And here is a partial list of compositions that contain quasi-periodic materials based on aluminum alone. All these are based on <coughs> aluminum. Aluminum, chrome, cerium, aluminum, iron, manganese, and so on and so forth. They're not rare. There are a huge number of them, hundreds of them. Maybe they're not stable. Well, many are not stable. But what does it mean, not stable? It means that if you heat them up, to 400 degrees C or so, then they will transform to a periodic phase. But at room temperature, they are stable. Anybody could study them at room temperature. And then there are some <coughs> that are stable. Stable means that they melt congruently. For those of you not in the field, it means that you heat them up, and until the melting point, until they melt, they will not transform into any other phase. They will melt, they will keep the structure up to that. So, no. This is not the reason why they were not discovered. Not because they're not stable. OK, maybe they're difficult to make. Mm. No, not at all. They're very easy to make. You can make them by casting. You can make them by rapid solidification, by single crystal growth, by electric deposition, CVD, PVD. Any method you make materials, you can make quasi-periodic crystals. No problem. This is not the reason. <coughs> maybe they are made of rare elements. Presidimium, gadolinium, and a touch of zinc. <laughs> no, not at all. They're made of iron, aluminum, chromium, copper, titanium, and so many more elements. Millions of tons of these elements are used every year. They're so abundant, it's unbelievable. They're cheap. They're not exotic. So why is it? What happened? Why is it for, for 70 years quasi-periodic materials were not discovered? My answer is... Number one, TM, transmission electromicroscope. Quasi-periodic materials could not have been discovered by any other method but transmission electromicroscopy because they were very small. Actually, you could not discover them. So, okay, so you can say, well, hundreds of thousands of students around the world over the years used electromicroscopy. Why you? Well, let me tell you something that you may not know. You have electron microscopy in this university, I know, I know the people in charge of that. We produce very few experts in electron microscopy. Of all these hundreds of thousands, very few become experts in electron microscopy. They use the machine. It's a wonderful magnifying glass. But they don't become expert on the machine. And this is because the machine is expensive to use. You pay $100 or so for every hour you use it. And the professor are not very happy to do that if they are not experts in them. 
and there are many other reasons. Very, and you have to dedicate years, and you have to learn the theory, and you have to practice electron microscopy to become an expert. So not everybody can do it. You have to be a professional, and this is professionalism. And for the students among you, I can say that in order to succeed in science, this is my own view, in order to succeed in science, you have to have a broad knowledge of science, a broad knowledge, but also at least one peak of expertise. Be excellent in one thing, and you will have a wonderful career. And you can choose the subject of expertise now. And try to become the best in that field. You can do that. Professionalism. Number three, tenacity. Tenacity means be like a Rottweiler dog. You bite, you don't leave. Don't let go. You find something interesting in science, something strange, work on it. Don't let go. In most cases, it will be an artifact. But in some cases, just some cases, you have made a great discovery. Don't let go. Let me give an example of somebody who did let go. There's at least one scientist in Europe who saw my diffraction pattern before me. How do I know that? His professor tells me. The professor tells me the following. One day I sift through the plates of my ex-students and find one plate, which is your diffraction pattern. I look at the, uh, the date before you, before 1982. So I called my ex-students, by now a professor in another university, and I said to him, hello, student, how are you doing? He said, I'm fine, professor. Do you know that you saw Danny Schechtman's diffraction pattern before him? He said, yep, professor, I know. He said, professor, why didn't you tell me? He said the ex-student, you know, professor? If I told you, you would want me to stay for two more years on my PhD? <laughs> <laughs> Grab something, don't let go. Tenacity. Believing in yourself. Believing in yourself if you are a professional, if you have repeated your experiments time and again to prove yourself that you are right, then stand tall. Listen to other people. Somebody may come up and say, here is, I repeated your experiment, and here is what you did wrong. OK, then talk to him. But if some theoretician comes and says, that cannot be, no. That's not good enough. If you think that my experiments are not right, repeat them and show me what did I do wrong. This cannot be is not a good excuse for rejection uh, finding. And last but not least is resilience. I had some tough times, you know, levels. Just, you know, everything will be fine, I said, and everything was fine at the end. Thank you very much.